Boa tarde a todos os presentes. Com muita satisfação, eu tenho a honra de abrir os trabalhos do nosso primeiro seminário internacional da área de humanidades do Centro para Inteligência Artificial, C4AI, fruto de uma parceria estabelecida entre a Universidade de São Paulo, a FAPESP e a IBM, e que completou um ano com excelentes resultados. O nosso primeiro seminário internacional contou com mais de 800 inscritos no Brasil e no exterior. Temos ouvintes nos acompanhando hoje da França, da Inglaterra, Finlândia, Estados Unidos, Colômbia, Portugal e assim por diante. O c 4 ai e a área de humanidades trabalham intensamente para garantir que a inteligência artificial no Brasil seja inclusiva, que não ofenda o Estado. Will be inclusive, that will not uh, offend our democratic state and not to offend our rights. Our freedom will rely on what we do right now. How are we going to face our main challenges? Challenges that are opposed by artificial intelligence. Our goal is to help the whole society to benefit from AI and not just a specific group of people. We all know that AI is a very revolutionary uh, technology in the world and our efforts to uh, include and develop our researches is directly related to our search to find a country that is more fair, developed, where science and universities will be valued and not attacked. Our goal and mission here is to guarantee that scientific knowledge will be disseminated to help to foster a state and a country that is fair and equal. That's why we have to guarantee that this innovative area will be inclusive, ethical, and full of tolerability. We know that if we do not apply and develop a science fully, that will increase inequality among people and countries. That's why C4 AI is after a better country where we want to foster a democratic state. This is the spirit and goal that we are all here together and so enthusiastic. We do not want to have this event concluded tomorrow with our last talk, but rather we want this to be a cascade that will lead to further reflections. Therefore, the development of our artificial intelligence should be organized in a very responsible and sustainable way. And here we are to guarantee all of that. Having said that, I welcome you all. And I also would like to greet all of those who helped and supported us to make our center available. Our center has as its main goal to seek for a country that will not just be a multiplier of our this technology, but also a leader of AI in Latin America. Now I'd like to invite our dean and also the pro dean, Professor Canuto, our President of APESP, Professor Marco Antonio Zari, the Director of IBM Research Brazil, Bruno Flark, and the Director of Advanced Studies from the University of Sao Paulo, Dr. Miguel Niplonsk, the Director of our Steering Committee, Professor Fabio Cosma, VP of our Steering Executive Committee, Mr. Claudio, and the coordinator of uh, Info USP, who is Mr. Catalani, and the publisher of our magazine and the head professor of the University of Philosophy, Sciences and Human Sciences of our university. You are all very welcome. And each one of those people that I have called now, they had a key role to make this first international seminar a reality. And the title is Artificial Intelligence, Democracy and Social Impacts. Before we proceed to our next 
speakers and talks, I would like also to highlight Professor Demi Getsko, who is the president director of NIC.br, and Professor Hartmut Glaser, who is the executive secretary of the executive steering committee of Internet CGI. Welcome you both, and I also would like to congratulate everyone who works for C4AI on behalf of our steering committee in charge of this international seminar. Professor Glauco Arbitz, welcome. Professor Sara Jani Pérez. Professor João Paulo Veiga. Professora Dora Kaufmann. Professor Dora Kaufmann. Professor Álvaro Comim. Professor Álvaro Comim. E professor Eugênio Butti. And Professor Eugênio Butti. Saudações a todos os meus colegas. So my dear thank you to all my colleagues from Human sciences. I also would like to thank the scientific committee who had counted on 23 experts who are internationally acknowledged in the AR field and they were responsible to uh, uh, they were responsible to check uh, lots of summaries. We are very happy with all the surveys and researches that were submitted and with all the participation that we got. I also would like to thank uh, Professor Burkak Schaffer, that is the director of the script of the Edinburgh University, and Professor David Leslie, who is the coordinator of the Ethics uh, Commission, and they will be our international key note speakers today. After all these initial remarks, I would like now to give the floor to our Dean Professor De Pian, who has a brief message to all of you who are participating at our international seminar today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this meeting addressing artificial intelligence, democracy and social impact. I'd like to congratulate all the organizing committee for such an initiative. And I also would like to thank you all for your participation and our sponsors, FAPESP and IBM, that made this event possible. If we took something positive from this pandemic time. We've learned that science should be the base and the evidence of our public policies that also will affect our society. Therefore, the social impact in our society should not be forgotten and its consequences should be taken into account, as well as its effects that have a very significant meaning. Therefore, this is a very current topic and a very timely initiative. And I am pretty sure that we are going to get lots of benefits and fruits out of this event. On the other hand, I'm here as well for another very important occasion, which is to greet Mr. Harmut Glaser and Mr. Demi Getsko. I have known these two fantastic uh, researchers and scientists for maybe over 40 years. They are very skilled uh, professionals. They stand out in their fields, but they are uh, the first ones. They are the pioneers. They are innovators. As a Brazilian, uh, as a researcher, as a citizenship, as a man who makes use of technology, I have to thank you deeply for everything that you have made so far. Thank you so much to both of you. You were 
key players to our country for the current status of uh, information technology where we are today. The Brazilian society should never forget about you both. This is a very um, worthwhile um, honor to be paid here to all to, to both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Bahan. Now I'd like to give the floor to Professor Silvio Canuto, who is a research pro dean. Hello, good afternoon. First of all, I feel so proud to be part of this opening session and surrounded by so many friends. And I have to thank our dear team that has been uh, managing this university for the past four years. I also would like to greet FAPESP president who we deeply respect. On behalf of Professor Glauco Apix, I also would like to thank for the opportunity to be here. And I also like to pay an honor to those two giant professionals. As Professor Bahan said, this is a field of expertise where we really have lots of gratitude for them both. From a personal perspective, I feel very moved to see our artificial intelligence center to be not just a reality, but a successful center. If you would allow me, I would like to go back in the past when we decided to have an intelligence center at our university. At that time, we had uh, released a edital to understand if we could prospect the possibility to open a center in our at our university. I had the chance to understand that a hundred projects were submitted by different groups and with uh, so many creative and great uh, projects we decided to open our center thanks to FAPESP and to the partnership with IBM our university uh, won that uh, award that prize and we got all the resources to open our AI center and I feel proud of that and I should thank so many people that embraced that idea. Therefore, on behalf of Professor Fabio Cosma, who was the first coordinator, I am not an expert in this field. And uh, Fabio, in addition to be a great leader, he was a great advisor. And on his behalf, I'd like to thank the whole C4 AI team and our deep thanks. And I also like to extend all my deep thank you to the whole IBM team. It's great to see that after our four years office, we have a solid uh, AI center that is already a uh, subject that we feel so proud of. Thank you so much, and I wish you all a great evening. Thank you, Professor Carmuto. Your contribution was essential. And thank you again for the support that you have given to the C4AI. Now I'd like to give the floor to FAPES President Professor Marco Zago. Meus amigos, minhas amigas. Good afternoon, friends. Christina has already named all my dear friends who are here today, I would like to greet Glauco, who is ahead of the seminar, and all my dear friends. But I would like to share with you my special greetings to Demi and Graça. 
we all recognize that they have had a key role in the development of IT and internet in Brazil. Some time ago, I wrote a paper in which I recalled that internet in Brazil started in LNCC and at FAPESP. And it seems to be exactly at the same time. And these two researchers have had a key role in it. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to be part of this cycle of conferences and debates about the social impact and the role of artificial intelligence in promoting democracy. Well, we are all quite familiar with hype cycle hyperbolic cycle created by Gardner, which published its annual reports about market trends in technology. And the concept concerns what happened when a new technology, innovative technology gets into public domain and gives rise to many expectations of rupture and disruption. However, the reality rarely gets as high as expectations because technology and the required knowledge for everything we need are not fully available yet. The innovations and the initial expectation are followed by disappointment and then technology gets mature and we get to a point of a new level of productivity. Now, concerning this approach, I should say that we are at the stage of major enthusiasm. Not everything that we expect to reach will be necessarily achieved. But despite the limitations, the main expectation that we all face today has or have been compensated by everything that we have achieved so far, which in turn encourage new uh, progression into health, city management, so smart cities, banking activities, etc. Despite computer power, artificial intelligence cannot do everything. In itself, it does not provide democracy. What can really ensure appropriate level of democracy are citizens. But artificial intelligence can contribute as an instrument to provide democracy and uh, protect us from fake news, for example. But it's an important warning. The computer power associated with artificial intelligence, big data, This great power does not have ethics or ideology. The same technology can be used for the good or for the bad of society. So people who use technology define how it's used. And this is why scientific advance cannot be apart from ethical discussion. And this is why we have to make important considerations for artificial intelligence and the whole uh, complex of technology really defend technology and democracy, we need citizens to be part of this process. To that end, we need digital education, we need digital literacy of citizens. And at the same time, we have to expand the training of scientists and foster more research. FAPESP has been trying to do that, dedicating uh, most of its attention to it. And together with IBM, it funds this center, which is promoting this uh, webinar today, which is going to address very important economic and social impact topics. There are 1,500 projects fully supported on this topic. 
It started in the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, with the first projects on neural networks. In the beginning of this year, we announced the creation of six research centers in artificial intelligence, together with the Ministry of Science and Technology, CGI, the Internet Management Center, etc. Once there is one center in Sao Paulo, another one in Campinas, Belo Horizonte, Ceará, and Bahia. And now there is a new uh, opening for construction of new centers. But at the same time, as we progress in incorporating technology, the discussion about its use becomes increasingly more necessary. And this is exactly where we can see the opportunity of having a seminar such as this one. Seminar that I am here, very interesting to attend. Thank you all very much. Oh, thank you, Professor Zago, for your very wise comments. The support of SAPSP has been absolutely essential. Thank you very much. Now I would like to hand it over to IBM Research Brazil Director Bruno Flack. Thank you very much, Christina. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by thanking you for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to be part of this opening ceremony and to be part of this panel with all the great researchers we have here. I would like to greet all of you. I am not going to name any of them because I would certainly forget some of them and that would be not desirable, of course. So I would like just to extend my greetings to all of you. I'll be very brief, but before I talk about the topic itself, I would like to greet the organizers of this event and the C4 AI. For us at IBM, it is an honor. And really, we see the great value we have in collaborating with the University of Sao Paulo and FAPESP in creating this center. We share a number of uh, common interest areas. And in our internal team, we always try to work in a very broad spectrum, focusing on new disruptive technology and mature technologies, which are more focused to industrial applications. In this path, we can see a number of the issues that Christina showed us, and some of my colleagues have also made some comments about. We are now in view of a very important technology, which is something that is going to have deep applications in the work uh, place, in institutional relationships, and in the way that societies uh, develop and work from then on. And this is why it's so important for all of us to have in our minds, all the potential ramifications and impacts that it may have on people's everyday experience. Of course, we would like technology to contribute so that we would improve not only the lives of those who work with it, but all of those who are engaged in its development. Considering models involving machine learning and all of that. So it is a center whose main initiative is here, centralized in Brazil. We strongly believe in it. In this first year, we have already evolved a lot and we believe we are going to carry on as is in the near future. We hope to have constant collaboration with all our partners. So thank you all very much. Have a great webinar and have a good afternoon. Thank you. 
Thank you, Bruno Flack. The partnership with IBM has produced very important results, and it is a pleasure to have you here with us in the opening of our seminar. Let me now hand it over to the director of the executive committee of C4 AI, Fabio Costa. Hello. Good afternoon. Good evening, brother. All of you who are here with us, I would like to greet all of you. I would like to greet all the panelists this evening and also send my greetings to all the organizations which have been instrumental in this process. Professor Vaham, who is a friend of mine in the School of Engineering and has had a great management position in the university, Professor Canuto, and as he said, the center was created based on an initiative of the Provost Office of Research. The center would not have come into reality without him, without his leadership, and I hope he can always be close to us. Let me thank Professor Zago, not only as chairman of FAPESPI, a very important uh, research fostering agency. He has uh, helped us a lot, but also Professor Zango as someone who used to be the Dean of University of uh, Sao Paulo, creating the new University of Sao Paulo. This is something very important that deserves to be mentioned. Let me thank Professor Catalani, who is director of the center, who is here with us in this virtual panel, because he managed this process and has had a fantastic management. Let me thank Professor Blansky, who has been very helpful. Well, Glasser and Gatchko are instrumental for all of us. I hope they can always be with us. So uh, let me greet all these special professors who are being homage here. Bruno, thank you, Bruno. Uh, and let me thank IBM and Claudio Viennes, who is the VP of the center, someone who has been instrumental, uh, not getting to know us, someone who is actively involved and engaged with us. Let me thank all of those who are organizers of many activities of our center, Christina and Glauco, who created this seminar at first, Eugenio, Sergio, and all the other organizers, João Paulo Vega, Sarah Jani, Dora Kaufman from the Pontifical University, University of Sao Paulo. So a number of organizations and institutions involved in this seminar. By thanking all of you, I would like to say that 15 years ago, and those who were in artificial intelligence at that time were still uh, struggling, trying to make things work. And the society was not very concerned. It seemed to be something too far away, sci-fi like. How would artificial intelligence impact our society? It has changed enormously and throughout the world, everyone is concerned about AI now. But in Brazil, there are very few centers that dedicate part of their efforts to really giving thought into AI. Therefore, C4 AI, since its inception and the way it was created, bringing people from different areas, has always focused on having a team of human sciences. All of those whom I mentioned and a number of others really support a lot this line of discussion. I hope this webinar can be the first of a number of them. And I also expect Brazil to become an international leader. Throughout the world, there is information about how AI impacts societies in the North Hemisphere. But very little is said about how AI impacts other countries, ours and a number of others. So I think there is a lot to be done. Once again, let me thank all of you, 
all the participants and all of those who have collaborated with our center in its first year of existence. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kasman. Let me take the opportunity to thank on behalf of C4AI and our team for your support to put together this event and your help has been instrumental to all of us. Before we pay our homage to Professor Harmut Glaser and Demi Getchko, we would like to show you a brief video which speaks a lot. It was produced to open the session specifically of this event, which sums up the research in human sciences of C4 AI. I would like to invite you to watch our video. Nós do C4AI e a comunidade de inteligência artificial temos a obrigação de refletir. Have to give thought about the weakening of some basic components that support life in democratic society. A number of tools that expand social tensions are correlated with technology when poorly guided may really need lead to events such as uh, fake news mass information, inequalities, Medo de um breach of the right of privacy, and also job inequalities. For scientific researchers, we cannot accept democracy to be questioned by technologies that we have helped create. It requires a strong commitment of bringing science to building a more Prof proficuous, fair society guided by equality and freedom. It's a huge challenge, and this is why we have to strengthen our understanding as a whole. And this is the best way to prevent inequalities of race, gender, income, and a number of other inequalities, convert technology into something that will help you repeat inequalities. We have a long way to a to go and for C4AY will move ahead. And this is why we have created the first webinar in humanities to talk about the social impacts of artificial intelligence and about democracy. We don't have just to be a user of uh, AI. We want to be producer. We want to participate in the rules that are being defined, ethics, transparency, responsibility. We cannot simply put everything within the same box as if everyone was the same. This is a very important discussion. We have to show that this is a legal discussion. This is an ethical discussion. Well, what if, if we go into machines and if we ask machines to make choices, the ethical issue gets philosophical complicators, which are even more serious. In general, people may get involved in this niche of getting prepared and prepare the society to accept technology. We have to be very careful and we cannot simply import the discussions that are being held abroad. We have to move towards the path of speaking more about our context. AI systems are partners of human specialists. It's one of the references for decision making. Well, this is our message to all of you. Now 
it's a very important time to all of us because it's the time to acknowledge all the hard work conducted by Professor Glaser and Professor Demigetsko. If we are here today talking about artificial intelligence, democracy and social impact, they have collaborated a great deal and now I would like to invite Professor Glauco Arbix, who is leader of research in humanities in, for C4AI, Professor Eugenio Gucci, who is coordinator for researchers in humanities for C4AI, Professor Getsko, who is director president for NIC.br, and Professor Harmut Glaser who is executive secretary of CGI.br. Now, Professor Eugenio, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. It's a great honor to be here. I wish I could say that I'm not an expert in artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence is an expert about myself and each and every one of us. We have no choice. We have to study and keep learning more about this topic. I am here feeling confident, but at the same time, I have a number of questions. I would like to greet Professor Harmut Glasser, and I will try and I'll do my best to summarize his background. He's got a bachelor degree in physics by the University of USP. He has a PhD in, in, in electronic engineering at the same very university, the University of Sao Paulo. He was a professor at the engineering university, Poly. He's a coordinator. He was a coordinator of our course between uh, in the in the 90s he is a advisor of uh, fapesp coordinator and he's the coordinator of the academic network of fapesp from 1992 until 2006 since 1992 he's an executive secretary of uh, the cgi He's got a very comprehensive international participation. He has participated at 65 meetings for the Internet Society, Internet Corporation for Assigning Names and Numbers. He was present at several meetings as a participant and also he organized a number of meetings in Brazil and he's got such a comprehensive CV. But there is something special that I'd like to uh, share about Glasgow something which I have witnessed before. He is like uh, someone who loves research. And as a piece of curiosity, I am a coordinator of Oscar Sala uh, chapter, which is a partnership between NIC.br and advanced uh, studies at the University of Sao Paulo. And I see Glaser as a student at our classes. He's always there. He does not miss not even one class. He's all the time curious. He's always after learning more. What's new? How can I, you know, add something new to my portfolio? And this is exactly a sign of any important researcher and anyone who is very innovative as he is. He unites both the ability to make things happen. And I am very proud to be the moderator of the session and to 
be able to introduce my dear friend, uh, uh, Harmut Glaser, and a big hug to you, our dear friend, Mr. Glaser. We from humanity would like to replicate all words here said by Professor Eugenio. And now I give the floor to Professor Glauco. Glazer and Demi, what an honor to be part of this important celebration. Demi, we are in contact quite frequent, and you are a very kind person. You have never denied any sort of support and all these uh, actions, and they were very positive to the Brazilian society and more especially to our university. And I'm here talking about our community. You, we feel so proud of uh, your uh, efforts. We are here saying all these words from the bottom of our hearts. Demi, he is a electrical engineer and currently he is the chairman of NIC.br, who is uh, responsible to uh, assign and coordinate the whole dot uh, com.br he was elected to to be part of the hall of fame in the internet for global connectors with due to his very intense and his strong participation in this field he got a number of awards in the computational field he was admitted in the merit award as a way to acknowledge all the relevant services that he has delivered to the communication. So a big hug, Demi. Demi was the was responsible for many endeavors, and I and the first connection in Brazil, which took place via FAPESP, that first connection of Brazil that uh, took place in Illinois, in the US, Illinois in the US, and that was fully sponsored by Demi. So C4AI, as well as everyone, who makes use of the internet, we owe that to you. You had a very important relevance in establishing the norms and standards of the internet, the way they work, they cope with freedom, autonomy, privacy, and that is so precious. I am very moved as well it's a very important time to all of us. And even though we are not able to meet in presence to give, uh, to hand in to you face to face uh, our plate of honor that you are going to get. So you see here both plates, Professor Glaser and Professor Getzko. A big uh, hug, a warm hug on behalf of everyone who researches about artificial intelligence, technology information. Thank you so much for everything you have done so far and this is a just a symbology of uh, all our respect for everything you have done thank you and now i hand over to christina again thank you professor for all your remarks uh, believe me that we all share same feelings and thoughts now i hand over to professor glaser for your considerations Good evening, August 25th, 2021. 
I was caught by surprise with a message signed by a number of uh, professors whose names were already mentioned here this afternoon. Eugenio, John Vega, Cristina Godoy, Sarah Janis, Alvaro Comin, Glauco, Dora Kaufman. On behalf of all these professors, I'd like to uh, greet all the attendees here tonight. This is a very special time. And I have to acknowledge that we have too many PhDs, too many doctors here tonight to hear a retired uh, professor from the Polytechnic Engineering School. And I'd like to dedicate my words to the former director of uh, Polytechnic Engineering School of the University of Sao Paulo and former president of FAPESP. And I had a chance to work with him for 12 years. And he was a master and he was the one responsible to give me this new site for this new reality and, the, and to change my, uh, my guiding towards technology. My main goal in relation to internet is the social part of it. Internet is a logical and physical part where people, they did and still do different sort of abilities. Among them, we have web and we have the emails. That's why the internet is responsible for social, commercial transactions and opportunities where we are able to share knowledge and information. I believe and I, and I advocate that this is an environment that should be available to all, to everyone, regardless of the hardware or the software, the network infrastructure, culture, geolocation, mental or physical skills, social economic uh, levels or level of uh, education of each one of those uh, who make use of those uh, networks. The giant reach of uh, global internet is responsible to a giant uh, data traffic, which became even more intense during the world pandemic, which had obliged the planet populations to isolate themselves and to keep carrying out their daily activities remotely from their home. Everyone working online from different apps. Several researches, they show such a high increase in the number of virtual and remote meetings that took place via video conference during COVID-19. Those tools they allow to exchange experiences without moving from one place to another. And that also allows to share information, text, audio, images, videos, chats, links among all participants. The intense internet use is responsible to characterize people's behavior in the computer's network. Each site that is assessed, each search that is done, each commercial transaction, each video and each image which is same and shared, each page that is published, they are all data of very high relevance which are collected to feed machine learning for those models of artificial intelligence that will recommend products and be responsible to help or to drive the decision-making process. Therefore, internet via web apps is not only the gateway to the internet, but also the way out for artificial intelligences. The way in as a mass supplier of data, which is collected from social media and accesses via 
search uh, tools and as a way out as a access platforms to those servers services offered by those apps that apply AI technologies in their platforms. The growth of adoption of those technologies in the world is attracting attention of our society in terms of uh, ethical and uh, ability and capacity. And from ethical perspectives, I mean implementations, design and human aspects. With that, it's very relevant to conduct a initiative by the Brazilian government, which is to follow a Brazilian strategy of AI, which is a program called EBIA. For our management committee in Brazil, a multi-stakeholder committee, which was created back in 2003, and that was confirmed by a prior um, decision from May. Uh, 95, which is mandatory to manage Brazilian internet and this Brazilian strategy to artificial intelligence should emphasize positive aspects of AI adoption, mitigating possible risks to different sectors of the society, to productive sectors and also to the public sector, to our management committee in Brazil, CGI, the main focus should be based at all levels of this strategy. We have several pillars, legislation, regulation, and ethical use of it. Second, governance of AI. Third pillar, aspects that would embed international collaborations. Fourth pillar, collaboration for a digital future. Fifth, work strength and capacity building. Sixth pillar, research, development, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Pillar seven, to, uh, uh, to foster application for the supply chain. Then public power and last pillar, overall, public security and our CGI Brazilian Management Committee has positioned our efforts in a very pro positive and collaborative manner, participating mainly at the uh, pillar two that we will address governance of AI and several strategic actions. I would like to summarize our participation, I mean the CGI participation with one sentence. CGI wants to support to foster public policies in the field of science, technology and innovation, participating in the collaboration and the core and international coordination, invest, investing in the preparation of new generations to the digital future. Examples of developed countries that built up an ecosystem in artificial intelligence in Brazil will require involvement of all these pillars where principles and governance initiatives should be mapped about artificial intelligence legislations. And moreover, additional efforts should be invested in the availability, data availability and data management that will support creation of AI, AI models specific to our region, to our market. And to close, just as just with a multi-stakeholder governance model, transdisciplinary, and that will consider not only technical aspects, but also social aspects of this new technology that is emerging, we will be able to effectively develop 
significant development to Brazil in the use of artificial intelligence. Once again, thank you so much for this uh, honor. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, Professor Glasser. The role of CGI was, has been, and will keep on being extremely important for the digital future of Brazil and for the construction of trustworthy AI. And it's really our pleasure to pay homage to you. Thank you very much for being so caring. Your importance for internet in Brazil cannot be measured. And your words, uh, as Professor Arbix has said, really touches our hearts. I would like now to hand it over to Professor Demi Gechko. Good afternoon, everyone. It is certainly an honor to be here with such remarkable friends, which are part uh, of uh, this seminar and especially this panel. I've been attending the seminar today in the morning. I am a, uh, a fruit. Uh, 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 someone who was uh, turned and learned from the University of Sao Paulo. And back in the 70s, when we started in our center of computer, there was a little bit about a network in integration, in integration of libraries. And we discussed that, different ways of accessing the um, library of medicine. Uh, and so there was a trend, so to speak, of using network. Then I joined FAPESP in 1985, and there, there was a pressure of accessing networks, especially those who went abroad for graduate studies. And thanks to the leadership of Professor Oscar Sala, we created a team whose main role was to provide services to the Academia of the State of Sao Paulo, which later expanded to the whole country. And when we started thinking about the uh, connection, Furman was very well known, all the physicists uh, knew him. Uh, we got in contact with the university and uh, it was a coaxial uh, submarine cable, underwater cable from Brazil to Illinois, close to Chicago. And when we did that, LNCC was doing the same and the BitNet network, because it's time, a very simple network just to transmit text. So Femin and I, they got one month before us getting connected to Maryland's, whereas we connected to Femin, but we had an advantage in the process as physicists were involved, Sala and others, and knew at FAPSP we had a DAC machine we could use in addition to BitNet, HalfNet, which was a net, much more powerful network that had access to computer. You could do something equivalent to NAT, which came later. So we just got uh, engaged in it and really start doing it. Then .br was registered in 1989, and there uh, nick.br was created. It get it autonomy in uh, uh, 1993. And uh, there were some ups and downs in the way, but all of them very positive and appropriate. First, in 1993, 94, when it was clear that the network wouldn't be limited to the academia only. There were examples in the US of CompuServe migrating millions of users to internet, people who did not know what to find. In Brazil, some BBS, so some specific channels wanted to get connected. So we realized that it would have to go beyond the academia. And it was important to have a multi-sector organization behind it, supported by all the end pioneers, Mike Standard, Alexander Grosko, all of those involved in it. So the managing committee was created in 1995. And there was one more example, which was very well received internationally. If things are seen well abroad, the structure, uh, uh, we are very respected. We have a good technical area here, but the legislation and the concept is very well developed. 
So as we had a multi-stakeholder model, even before ICANN, which is a multi-stakeholder agency, so internet brings this concept of multi-stakeholder discussion, which cannot be abandoned when we are discussing artificial intelligence, as this seminar is clearly showing. Multi-stakeholder model is now part of the discussions, which somewhat has derived from what we used to do in the past. We've been through a large period, and I am not only grateful uh, to the University of Sao Paulo, but also uh, being part of it. So we've heard the current dean and the previous dean, and I was part of the information technology group under those two deans. And it was wonderful to see the progression of the information technology area at the University of Sao Paulo. And once again, now University of Sao Paulo is creating a artificial intelligence center, really anticipating other initiatives with the involvement of humanity, science, uh, Fabio and PNS creating a great initiative. And I'm very glad and proud to be part of it. I would like just to conclude by saying that the expansion of internet in my vision has resulted from different waves. It started from the academia, then there was the organized society, those activists wanted that. That was in the beginning of the 90s. Brazil hosted ECHO, uh, the ECHO in Rio, Brazil, in Rio, because it was uh, the, an international conference and we had to provide that. And then the third wave was the wave of providers in 94, 95, when they saw a business model. And we really have to pay, uh, pay uh, tribute to Minister of Social Motor, the Ministry of Telecommunication at that time. And Ambertel and all telecoms had to deliver that to providers who would ultimately take it to users. So it provided significant growth uh, involving generation of content. At first I said, well, internet's all going to be in English. How are people going to use it? And it just changed overnight with Brazilian content. So that was the third wave. The fourth wave was the involvement of the government creating services through the internet to the community. And the fifth wave were the telecom companies. They realized that they could work not only delivering empty tubes so that we would fill it up, but they started to rent the fill up tubes with a specific internet load. And this is the wave that we all currently witness. And we have to preserve the concepts of internet very well described by the 10 guiding principles of uh, internet. So we have an excellent legislation of internet here in Brazil. Everyone realized that our legislation is brilliant, uh, advocating for neutrality and uh, uh, the involvement of some specific areas uh, and uh, levels of punishment and accountability uh, or not. And this is a discussion which I think is essential. Sometimes we run some risk because the internet has provided access to everyone, but at the same time, it has generated a incredible amount of information. In the past, we would search for information. So the information gets to us. We don't have to look for it. Information gets to us because of AI and others. So it has created a cacophony because we think very little and say a lot because internet has given us the source, the uh, fuel. And I hope that we go back to a, a time when we get a healthy environment uh, and can uh, live without uh, so much fraud and crime so that we can really benefit from everything that internet gives to us. And well, AI, we've always been interested in it. My master was in imagery recognition in the 80s. And then I migrated to that 
it was something uh, my PhD was in supercomputers, somewhat different. And I would like just to share with you a caveat as this is an important term, everything is labeled as AI. Some things are AI, others are not. So we really have to know what artificial intelligence is. And if it is so, it has to be addressed as a tool to be properly used for the progress of community as one, and not as some machine which will decide what is right or wrong for us. Because AI is a uncontrollable. Well, we have to have transparency in AI. Well, what is going to uh, really uh, make you beat the computer? You are not going to do, even though you have the code there, AI will beat you in a game. So we cannot have illusions. What we should have is full control over its use. So I'm delighted to be here. Please accept my greetings. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Professor Gecko. Gecko, really very wise words. And this is what we want to create, AI with responsibility, fair society, free and reliable. And our future is, lies in the hands of what we are going to do today. So please accept our greetings. We are very glad to be able to pay tribute to all of you for all your effort and work to really have, bring the internet to Brazil. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all the members of this panel, Professor Garco Bliss, Eugenio Bucci, and in addition, we shouldn't fail to thank our sponsors and uh, supporters who helped us, Sebrapi, Unique.br, YEPD, Institute of Data Protection, Observatório de Renovação, and Yahoo Hus. USB. Thank you very much for your support. If we are here today, we owe it to you. Said that, let's start our discussion about the topic of AI and democracy, reason why we decided to hold this event today. We are going to show a video of Professor David Lesser, coordinator of the area of ethics of Alan Turing Institute, who has prepared an exclusive uh, presentation for today. Alan Turing Institute was created in 2015, founded by five large universities in the United Kingdom, Cambridge, Edinburgh, Oxford, UCL, and Warwick. And currently, it's a research center in AI internationally recognized, and it has a number of interesting reports. It was sponsored for 2021 and 2021, funded with 10 million pounds just to study the future of AI and data science in the UK. So let me now show you the video of Professor David Lesser who is going to give you an overview of ethics and artificial intelligence. Hello, my Hello, name is David, my name is David Lassie. Lassie. I'm the ethics lead at the Alan Turing, Turing Institute, 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 which is based on the National Data Science and Intelligence Institute. Institute. I should begin just, I should by, begin saying just by saying how grateful I am to be here at, at C4AI. C4AI. Uh, uh, I, I, I am just honored to be able to contribute to the conversation about responsible AI innovation in Brazil, and uh, thankful that uh, University of Sao Paulo has uh, extended an invitation to me. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, what I've called AI ethics as a vocation. And when I talk about um, AI ethics as a vocation, I'm really sort of referring to the idea that, that AI ethics can be thought of as a calling, which responds to a set of opportunities and, and challenges that really uh, put the, the, the kind of future of humanity in the lap of the present. And so let me just begin by uh, motivating uh, the work that we do at, in the ethics theme at the Alan Turing Institutes, uh, and, and also uh, then uh, moving on to, to, to zooming in and, and uh, saying a little bit about how uh, the, the actual projects that we're engaged in are responding some, to some of the uh, challenges and opportunities uh, that I'm gonna refer to. So right off the bat, uh, we might say, 
that uh, we are at a, a kind of inflection point uh, in the history of uh, AI and data-driven systems. Uh, AI is increasingly a general purpose technology, spreads across all sectors. It can potentially penetrate into all domains of a human experience. And, and what that means on the ground is, is that uh, the, the use of these systems can either uh, be an enabler for the achievement of a lot of good, or it can be an enabler for uh, the opening up of possibilities to do a lot of harm in the world. And so uh, ultimately, we can think of, of AI as not just a general purpose technology, say like electricity, but also as a gatekeeper technology uh, whose producers hold the key to uh, unlocking either the summum bonum, the greatest good for all, or the summa malum, uh, humanity's greatest bad. And you can see just uh, from the slide that we can think of AI as potentially enabling the achievement of the sustainable development goals um, or opening up um, global catastrophic risks such as the uh, uh, proliferation of lethal autonomous weapons, AI enabled uh, 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 synthetic biology or sort of genetics arm braces, uh, a slew of other uh, potential catastrophic harms, uh, mass surveillance, many other um, possibilities uh, that are opened up by the technologies. And so we, we, at this moment, at this crucial moment, which we might even think of as a tipping point, we are really faced with with answering this question, what shape will the digital society of tomorrow take? And, and really that is the, the, the vocation or calling of AI ethics is to, is to start answering this question. And, and one of the more direct ways to enter into that space of answering is to think about the more direct challenges that AI is presenting. And there are numerous of these challenges and we can think of these as um, hazards that are being raised by uh, increasingly pervasive AI and what will ultimately become the internet of everything, the kind of connected future of society. And so just to run through some of these, uh, and, and these, again, we need to think of these as specific challenges on the ethical or normative plane. We can first think of uh, this uh, component of the loss of human agency and social connection. So there are potentially dehumanizing consequences of integrating AI systems um, into you more, more and more ubiquitous uh, cyber physical systems, like so in the kind of connected world that we live in. Uh, individuals uh, may feel disempowered. Uh, they may feel like they're, they've been manipulated or reduced to statistics, the more and more automation that exists in a world around them. And also uh, cru crucially, uh, human connection, so trust and empathy may be lost through automation and um, uh, the, the sorts of algorithmic curation that can tend to isolate and polarize people. Uh, another challenge will uh, have has to do with a harmful and poor quality outcomes. So indeed, uh, algorithmic models, as we know, are only as good as the data on which they're trained and tested. Um, this is, uh, as, as some of us call it, garbage in, garbage out, right? So a set of inaccuracies and, and measurement errors across data collection and recording can taint data sets. Um, as uh, there's more and more collection, um, with uh, pervasive sensor monitoring, so in our mobile phones and other um, bits of the world, in our in our keyboards, uh, th there's uh, uh, increasing chances of having uh, measurement errors or inaccuracies. And and as as we move into this uh, sort of future of, of ever more datafication, um, using uh, poor quality data may have grave consequences. Uh, and, and wider and wider consequences for individual uh, well-being and public welfare. Um, thirdly, there's also this issue of entrenched bias and discrimination, or, or we could even say the entrenchment and amplification of bias and discrimination. So data-driven uh, systems, so supervised machine learning models, draw their insights from ex existing um, data distributions. And so when they work reliably, they make accurate out of sample predictions by basically replicating um, the social and cultural patterns from the past 
um, regardless of whether these patterns are inequitable or discriminatory. So the training uh, data sets are um, what's honing the um, accuracy of uh, these models and when this is drawn on social and demographic data uh those uh those data sets can have biases baked into them and and, and patterns of structural inequality and discrimination baked in uh baked into them and so um in the big picture ubiquitous analytics of social data so data that's uh that's um, of a social and demographic nature may augment discrimination and structural injustices. And, and this is a major problem that we simply need to uh, uh, stem as early as possible as we try to kind of craft the future of some use cases for AI. Uh, fourthly, we can think of uh, widening global and local digital divides. So uneven global and local distribution of access to and the benefits uh, of pervasive AI promises the hyper exacerbation of existing dynamics of societal inequality. Infrastructure requirements for balanced uh, progress in the distribution of intelligent cyber physical systems um, demand a level of social equality that is orders of magnitude greater than that which currently exists. And this is this is um, true at both the, the global level, so where you've got um, big tech companies in the global north, uh, in a sense, largely dominating um, some of the infrastructures that enables um, the advancement of innovation. But we also uh, might think of it um, in terms of local digital divides. So di digital divides within um, nation states and regions where um, the uh, access to the benefits of, of uh, AI driven innovation are simply um, not um, not differentially distributed in an equitable way. So there are are, are some winners and some losers that are, are divided, if you will, by the the the, um, the high relief between um, the 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 uh, the beneficiaries and those who are excluded from uh, each side of the digital divide. Um, fifth, we can think of, of issues of data integrity, privacy, and security. So with the multiplication of sites of, of behavioral, social, and environmental measurement and processing on a low energy network devices, issues of data integrity and infrastructural security will intensify in kind. Um, this will escalate risks of, for instance, hacking at scale, cyber terrorism and privacy violations and magnify their consequences. So, in other words, as we become increasingly connected and as AI is more and more pervasive in supporting various dimensions of our everyday lives on our devices and in our in our kind of lived experience, there are just more entry points for um, violations of data security, violations of privacy um infringements on the integrity of, of data and data processing and and last but not least uh another consideration is biospheric harm and so here we just need to think about the environmental costs of mass real-time information processing and also uh the this the this the kind of costs of training large uh training ai systems on large scale uh data sets and 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 these things are potentially prohibitive a connected um, world of information of things and of a ubiquitous AI systems and cyber physical systems, where large scale industrial, agricultural, transportation, health, and infrastructural processes and products are smartified or become intelligent. Um, this will pose, in that world, it will pose risks to biospheric sustainability. Um, by virtue of the magnification of energy consumption. And, and so we really need to be um, uh, careful about doing uh, the sort of environmental impact assessments and ex ante or um, reflective anticipate, anticipation of potential risks that uh, the sort of costs of, of both processing and training might, um, might present. And so basically those those six hazards I, I want to I want to say is a launching point for us to kind of zoom in now and, and think a little bit more um, together about what what kind of things that we need to be thinking about right now and and also 
uh, is specifically what type of things that what type of projects we're taking up at the Alan Turing Institute to respond to uh, these various challenges. And, and so let me just uh, go through some of what our work uh, at the uh, in the ethics theme at the Institute comprises and run through some of those projects. And so really we do three, uh, we, we could organize our activity in, in three buckets uh, uh, in the ethics theme. So we conduct academic research, uh, we inform policy and help set gold uh, standards in the public sector. And we also really work hard to involve people in governing technology and technology policy. So we're very much uh, steeped in advancing participatory involvement in innovation. And um, what I wanted to do is just start by talking about our academic research and public engagement work, right? So those are the two kind of bookends there and, and really focus in on uh, the range of interests that we have and how that is really responding to some of the challenges I just mentioned. So the, the public policy program is home to, to many research projects involving more than 65 academic researchers from over a dozen universities. Uh, we have various tranches of activity, so uh, we're funded um, through research councils. Um, uh, on one side, we have the Strategic Priorities Fund, which uh, really uh, it, it really um, enables our work in the criminal justice sphere. Uh, but we also do um, work, which I'm going to focus on more on AI and society, um, and that's that's academic research that covers, as you can see a wide range of issues and, and really what I'm going to talk about today um, focuses on this um, sort of navy blue column uh, that 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 uh, has all all of these um, uh, topics that are, are really kind of um, opening up the uh, questions about the area of how we can think about the social and ethical impacts of the use of data driven systems in AI um, uh, as that uh, as that ramifies into um, society and and the communities that these systems affect. And uh, so just to go through a few of these uh, projects. Um, first, uh, we, we've done a lot of work on thinking through AI ethics and governance in children's social care and early life. Uh, in January 2020, we published a comprehensive study on the ethics of use of machine learning in children's social care that was undertaken um, in collaboration with the Reese Center Oxford. And really this work, uh, if we can think back to the challenges, focused on both the kind of data quality dimension, but also on the possibility that data use of data-driven systems in children's social care can really um, act to amplify um, discriminatory patterns, especially when the systems that are 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 being constructed and pred the predictive risk models that are being constructed um, are not done in a sufficiently discrimination and bias aware way. And uh, on the back of that work that we that we did at the Recenter, we more recently have um, partnered with UNICEF um, to collaborate on ex uh, and explore how. Um, to govern public sector technologies in a way that's responsive to the impacts of uh, AI on children uh, and their families. And so really to think about how to craft um, a, a world of, of, of using AI for the benefit um, of children and families in a way that's responsive as to the specific needs and uh, requirements of children's and children and families. And so we, we basically had started, you can see here from the nine requirements that UNICEF um, has, has uh, come up with for child-centered AI. And our research question um, in this, in this um, research was really, what are the deficits and gaps in the way that the UK public sector approach, approaches to AI ethics and governance respond to the unique demands surrounding the protection of children's rights, interests, and developmental needs? Um, another project that I, that I would, uh, would just really flag up um, that, that has also to do with the issue of discrimination and bias is some work we've, we've take, taken up on understanding um, the, the, the role of bias in facial recognition technologies. And so um, in, in late 2020, in October, we were tapped by um, the BBC to produce a comprehensive support a uh, supporting primer um, on the ethics of facial recognition technologies. You can see um, on the 
uh, left here. Uh, this was the uh, the the actual investigative report that was done by Maryam Ahmed, in which um, our our report, which is on the right, was was embedded as a, as a kind of supporting explainer. Um, this work um, uh, won the 2021 Royal Statistical Society Award for Investigative Journalism. Um, and and just to give a little bit of a, a of of a of a kind of uh, preview of, of what, what's contained in there, really the research highlighted the compounding effects of intersectional discrimination. So that's where um, protected characteristics like uh, uh, race and gender uh, overlap in, in discriminatory effects and, and can, uh, when put together, amplify discriminatory effects. Um, specifically in facial recognition technologies. And the work also explored the cascading effects um, of structural racism in the field of computer science. And um, we also in, in the piece explored um, how the history of these technologies is rife with both what we might think of as harms of allocation. So harms that have to do with the distribution of benefits of opportunities and risks of the technologies, but also harms of representation, which were which are harms that have to do with um, harms that uh, affect the, the recognitional rights of people to to be um, equitably recognized in terms of their uh, claims for identity. And, and in the report, we talk about this as a kind of double barreled discrimination. So distributive and recognitional injustices. Um, another uh, strain of work that, that touches on some of the challenges um, is work that we um, have been funded uh, through the UK, through UKRI and work that's being taken up with RIKEN, which is um, Japan's uh, oldest uh, re science research institute. And this is called Path, Path AI. So this is uh, mapping um, an intercultural path to privacy agency and trust in human AI ecosystems. And, and it's really important to note here that this work is really um, zeroing in on uh, thinking through um, not just how we, we really do need to think about how increasing automation and pervasive AI is um, creating um, challenges for privacy, challenges for uh, human um, autonomy, challenges to um, levels of social dis, uh, social trust and, and solidarity in virtue of, say, the polarizing effects of some of of these large scale technologies. But we need to think of that uh, in the ethical space, not just um, through a kind of a Western centered anchoring. We need to think of it interculturally because these are global problems, and and that's really um, kind of what Path AI uh, uh, sort of takes on is how do we start to think of of these issues interculturally. And um, just to say that work, uh, it, was, it, it was sort of taken on in the context um, initially of COVID-19 and to the UKRI, to UKRI's credit, uh, they basically said, well, why don't you um, shift your research focus um, to thinking about privacy agency and trust um, as it relates to AI's use and the use of data-driven systems in the COVID-19 context. And, and so the first kind of half of this research project has really been dedicated to thinking about those issues in the context of COVID-19. And you can see some of the, some of the essays and, and work that we've produced with that. And I'll, I'll finally just uh, mention one last project, which is also uh, leaning towards uh, advancing a more uh, inclusive and intercultural uh, uh, vision of, of, of some of the, the kind of needed work that's being done in, in AI ethics. And, and this is a, a, a project that's been funded by the Global Partnership on AI called Advancing D uh, Data Justice Research and Practice. And just to say, this project really aims to widen the lens of current thinking around data justice, which is a crucial component of AI ethics, and to provide a kind of actionable resources that, that are meant to help policymakers, practitioners, and impacted communities gain a broader understanding of what equitable, freedom-promoting, and right-sustaining data collection, governance, and use should look like in increasingly dynamic and global data innovation ecosystems. And so just very quickly, um, what this um, project has entailed and what we're involved in right now, this is going on, uh, we started in July, we will work straight through until next April. Um, so we're producing a, a, a literature review in which we provide um, access uh, to uh, 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 an annotated bibliography and we present six pillars of data justice. Um, you can see them here. 
Uh, they are uh, power, equity, access, identity, participation, and knowledge. I don't really have time to sort of explore these um, specifically, but I'll make sure to uh, avail the slides and um, make sure that uh, if you're interested uh, uh, to provide some of the links to our reports on this. Um, but in addition to sort of laying out the data justice pillars, we then use these uh, pillars as a, a kind of bridge to writing preliminary guides that are that are really um, geared towards three stakeholder groups. We've got um, policymakers and we've got developers and practitioners. And then thirdly, we've got impacted individuals and communities. And so we're using the pillars to produce uh, uh, very practice based guides about advancing data justice um, to uh, empower um, uh, practitioners, policymakers, and impacted communities to really think about what an equitable future um, in uh, data-driven systems and AI looks like. And I should also just mention one of the main things about this work, um, which uh, is a, a such an important part uh, if we think about the, the advancing AI as uh, AI ethics as a vocation is to is to really uh, integrate community um, into the production of the policy and into the into setting the direction of travel of the innovation and so to do this we're both um, reaching out through this excellent participatory platform called Decidee, um, which is a, a kind of open source engagement platform that's allowing us to reach out to um, impacted communities at the digital level, but we've also been the beneficiary of additional funding um, that's enabled us to, to incorporate um, 12 pilot partner organizations from across the world, um, which are, are, are really helping us uh, tap into um, all of the different uh, uh, stakeholder communities um, in the different regions of the world that really do need to uh, have their voices and lived experience amplified in the way we think about data justice. And, and just to say, um, we've gone through and we have done a, a competition and we've recruited um, 12 uh, partners that are helping us pilot the pillars and the guidances. And you can see just um, add by what you have in front of you, we have um, from all over Africa, We've got ITS uh, Rio from Brazil. We've got Internet Bolivia. We've got um, really wonderful organizations uh, from uh, Oceania Digital Natives Academy and Gate Media in Australia. And these are all, um, this is a community that's helping us uh, really uh, explore how to be more intercultural and inclusive uh, when we think about the future of, of data justice and uh, AI ethics more generally. I realize I've run out of time. So thank you so much for listening and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your conference. Thank you so much. Muito obrigada, professor David thank you. Thank you very much, David Leslie. The project studies are extremely intriguing and really address ethics and AI. Well, now it is our turn to talk about high court risk legal and ethical syndrome for artificial intelligence in the justice system. So I would like to be part of the panel. Our speaker for high risk at the high court, Professor Burkett Schaffer. He is the director and co-founder of the Script Center of the University of Edinburgh. It's also important to point out that the University of Edinburgh is one of the founders of the Alan Turing Institute. And it's also an organization that's carrying out state-of-the-art research on artificial intelligence. So please keep track of all the studies that are being carried out involving these centers, all of them extremely promising and interesting. Professor Schaffer has his training in linguistics and computer science, philosophy, philosophy logics, and law. His main area of research is the interface between law, technology, computer technology, and science within a comparative 
legal nature. Professor Schaffer has over 120 papers in law and technology, and he has been PI in a number of research studies funded by over 20 million uh, pounds. So thank you very much, Professor Schaffer, for having accepted our invitation to be here. And having you here is extremely important to all of us. We also know that because of the time zone, uh, it's 10 30 p.m in the uk so once again i thank you very much for having accepted the invitation to be here that late at night on monday <laughs> and so thank you very much on behalf of the area of uh, human and humanities at c4ai for accepting our invitation your topic is extremely interesting to all of us and to society at large so please accept my greetings I would also like to invite as mediator, Professor Guilherme Ariplansky. Professor Ariplansky is a director of the Advanced Institute Center of the University of Sao Paulo. He has his master PhD in full, a professor role in engineering at the University of Sao Paulo. He is a professor of uh, the area of administration, School of Administration, University of Sao Paulo, and associate professor of the Department of Production Engineering at the same university. His main line of research is policy and technology management. Professor Plonsky, of course, I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation to be the mediator of this panel. And I would also like to thank you on the area of humanities at C4AI for all the support of Advanced Institute Center has provided to us collaboration on the preparation, all the discussions we've had up to the publication of the main papers that have been published. So thank you very much. So Professor Plomsky, welcome. And now will you please carry on. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I would like to start by thanking for the privilege to be here tonight. Thanks to our great team at the Institute, and many of you are researchers and have been in our Institute, but we have a very great support team. I would like to thank you for the privilege to have collaborated and interacted so that we could have such an international webinar. I would like to greet the lead of uh, C4AI, Professor Flavio Cosman, Claudio Pianes, FAPASPI, and especially the organizers of this webinar. If I may and get somewhat out of the protocol, I would like to send my greetings to my dear friends, Glassy and Demi, who were here, paid tribute in, uh, and they are just so deserving of everything we said about them. Christina has already introduced the essence of the uh, journey of Professor Buckhard Schaffer, our keynote speaker. But I would just like to add by uh, bringing about some additional elements that have really struck me. And then I will just make a very brief comment about the topic that will be addressed. I'm going to do it in English because we are already uh, apart from a physical distant perspective as we are not on site as we wish we could all be. And we are here just mediated by a screen, behind screen. So I would like to uh, speak English so that I could speak directly to you in one of the languages that uh, Professor Schaeffer speaks. Because as you will see, he has his training, a quite eclectic training, also uh, in going through different universities. Professor Schaffer, uh, you're very welcome. It's my privilege on behalf of the organizers of this meeting to briefly not introduce you. Professor Christina already did it uh, for our public, but just to mention some aspects that uh, impressed me by reading your 
your extensive and uh, uh, very uh, relevant uh, uh, CV. Uh, first, I was impressed by the fact that uh, you have a, a multidisciplinary uh, 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 period uh, in different universities that brought you up uh, intellectually. Uh, you studied theory of science, logic, uh, theoretical linguistics, philosophy, and law in universities in three different countries. In Germany, in uh, University of Mainz and, uh, and uh, Munich, in Italy, uh, in Florence University, in University of Florence, and in the UK, in the University of Lancaster. Uh, and this, I, I think, brings uh, what is very uh, characteristic of uh, your journey, which is interdisciplinarity. And uh, I feel it is uh, very uh, relevant for the Center for Artificial Intelligence. And it also speaks to our Institute for Advanced Studies that by definition is interdisciplinar, interdisciplinary. Uh, I would also uh, uh, mention that uh, you are not only a, a researcher and a teacher, obviously, this is our main role in the university, but I, I, I understood from your curriculum uh, that you are also what we call an academic entrepreneur. Uh, you are a co-founder and as mentioned, the current the director of SCRIP, which is a Scottish Research Center for Intellectual Property and Technology Law, which was established in 2002, almost 20 years ago. Uh, you are also a co-founder and co-director of the Joseph Bell Center for Legal Reasoning and Forensic Statistics uh, at the uh, University of Edinburgh Law School. Uh, anyhow, so, uh, and obviously uh, you uh, also have a strong in uh, involvement in national and in international organizations that promote uh, the exchange between computer science and law. So uh, formally and on behalf of the organizers, I would uh, uh, very much welcome you to the seminar to be the keynote speaker and allow me just to uh, have a, a brief uh, comment or a brief impression of uh, uh, the title, uh, it's a very interesting title that you gave, High Risks at the High Court, Legal and Ethical Guidelines for artificial intelligence in the justice system. You mentioned high risks at the high court. May I add three uh, expressions uh, to high risks and high court? High tech, obviously, both in the sense that we are talking about uh, advanced technology, but also the fact that we have uh, high tech corporations, uh, which are, if we, if we would like or not, uh, involved in this uh, area. Uh, as also uh, Christina mentioned, we have high expectations of the use of artificial intelligence in, uh, uh, in the uh, legal system, is particularly in high court, in the high court. And uh, uh, these expectations uh, are I think, in, at least in the case of Brazil, mainly focused on high performance. High performance mean, means not only being, uh, let's say, uh, uh, just as it is, or justice, uh, and uh, as was presented in the previous uh, uh, talk by, by uh, the Alan Turing Institute, but also what is important in Brazil, in general for the justice system is also the issue of timing. Uh, things uh, in our uh, systems of justice take a long time and sometimes uh, this is uh, not good. So this is virtual high five, high five, high risks, high court, high tech, high expectations, high performance. Uh, I would now informally welcome you to Sao Paulo to the to University of Sao Paulo, to the Center for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, and we celebrate the special occasion to learn from you and to interact with you. We'll have uh, 
your presentation and then around half an hour for questions and answers. Please, Professor Schaffer. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for your um, kind um, uh, in, in invitation. Um, I just realized, I think I shared the, the wrong screen. Um, can you, yep, my PowerPoint now. Um, it's, it's, it's really a pity that uh, we have to do it uh, online. I, I very fondly remember my last time I was in Sao Paulo and I would have loved to be with you tonight, um, but we will uh, make do with what we have. And uh, again, very, very uh, many thanks for your kind words and your kind introduction. The high five, uh, I really should have thought of that. That is excellent. The next version of this talk will definitely feature them. Um, yeah, um, what I want to, to talk about to, to, to you um, today is uh, really the use of AI in the justice system. So one very specific application of AI in which I was involved over the last 25 years. Um, we built legal expert systems back in the 1990s when AI was still symbolic logic paradigm, a symbolic manipulation paradigm um, that obviously fell out of favor uh, when the second AI winter struck. And that was really when I moved to law and uh, became, became a regulator rather than a builder. And these days uh, with, with research and interest in AI, um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to divide my time again between the building of legal tech and, and the regulation of legal tech. Um, what many think of uh, the greatest impact on AI and law, and one of these enduring images that we very often find in the popular press, is this notion of the AI judge. And here we get a particularly um, a headline grabbing um, picture, AI judge comes to the same conclusion as humans in human rights trials. That's a um, project that was able to predict, uh, so the authors claimed the decisions of the European Court of uh, Human Rights with a very high level of accuracy. And from that, many people deduced this will mean that even the uh, most important part of uh, judicial reasoning, the, the actual decision making, in a trial context one day in not so far future will be outsourced uh, to machines. And at the same time, while there's enthusiasm for AI reaching new heights, we are also uh, accepting and realizing more and more that there are significant worries. And we have heard some of them in the previous talk, obviously. Um, that is from the infamous Compass system that really alerted everyone to the inherent dangers of AI. Um, that was a system used to determine the risk of reoffending, uh, and with that uh, introduced uh, a component of automation in the sentencing process. And one of the things we learned when that data was analyzed uh, more rigorously was that it had um, amplified and um, adopted some of the biases of the justice system from which it had learned, and uh, in particular treated uh, offenders uh, from ethnic minorities much less favorably than comparable offenders from um, uh, white uh, constituencies. So on the one hand, we have the um, vision of a automated future. On the other hand, we have increasing recognition of the dangers that are inherent in it. Um, this uh, now asks us, uh, I think collectively, how can we use AI responsibly? What sort of regulatory framework do we need to maximize the benefits while uh, minimizing the dangers? And um, one of the projects I was involved with um, uh, was AI for People. Um, that was an expert group um, convened by Otomium, the European Institute for Science, Media and Democracy, a Brussels-based think tank with very close connection to the European Commission. And back in 2018, we, we delivered our first report, uh, chaired at the time by Luciano Floridi, um, on a ethics framework for AI. How can we get a good AI society? And that first um, project really gave us some top level general ethical principles that uh, will be, could be important for um, the development, the responsible development of AI. And we followed that up with a second uh, project that time uh, chaired by Ugo Pagallo, 
um, on um, a ethical framework for the good AI society, moving beyond uh, abstract ethics principles to a more concrete approach to ethics governance, data governance and AI governance. That was the um, second reiteration. And I would say, um, even, even if it sounds a bit as self uh, laudatory um, that uh, these two reports had some impact on uh, the Brussels thinking about the regulation of AI, partly because members of AI for people were also members of the high expert, uh, high, high level expert group of the European Commission that uh, over the last two years then developed proposals for legislative reform. So moving beyond uh, the ethics principle to something that has real bite um, that comes with uh, the weight of the law behind it, as we had indicated, was necessary in some of these reports. And the latest outcome of that is the EU AI Act. Um, that is a legislative proposal at the moment before the um, European Parliament. It hasn't been enacted yet, um, but there are good chances that over the next year this will become European Union law. And I will very, very briefly say a few things about the EU AI Act partly to identify what I still perceive some of its shortcomings. It does follow some of the recommendations we made in these two reports, but I think it still falls short in some systematic ways of what we would want for AI specifically in the justice system. And then I'm going to talk about the third report we did uh, for Tomium um, that um, I was chairing and that specifically deals with um, law and the justice system as a field of application. So what does the um, EU AI Act do? It's a proposed regulation by the European Parliament. It is a sector independent proposal, very, very few exceptions such as the military, but unlike, for instance, the General Data Protection Directive, police and policing is explicitly included in its remit. Uh, it's an attempt to create a general framework for the development of AI, partly recognizing that one and the same algorithm can be used in quite a number of applications and therefore also uh, making it desirable to have a domain independent regulation. It lays down, uh, lays down harmonized rules um, for uh, the development, placement, marketing and use of these AI systems. So uh, covering potentially the entire life cycle of a AI product. And um, the um, bit of the legal framework, just to the extent that it is necessary, the competency is Article 114 of the Treaty of the Function of the European Union. And uh, with that, the overall objective, and we will have to come back to that, is to reduce um, the uh, existence of current trade barriers with broad fundamental human rights concerns. So the main objective is reducing trade barriers. And the way to do this is to create a base level of human rights. That means once a system meets that threshold, once a system can be certified to adhere to the basic standards of European human rights framework, then every member state should accept that system also on its territory and not impose unnecessary further regulation on it. Um, the main enforcement body is a market surveillance authority and uh, very similar to um, uh, things that we find in the European Union in product uh, uh, and liability law. Um, so essentially it treats AI as a specific type of product. And for me already here, there are two reasons to pause just for a second. Um, on the one hand, obviously reducing of trade barriers is very, very welcome. And we definitely want a frictionless trade within the European Union. But law always was a little bit different there. Um, even despite significant harmonization efforts, um, the different European nation states maintain control of their legal system. And they obviously are deeply steeped in history. Um, German law, French law, the UK uh, until very recently have long and proud traditions, legal traditions that have developed their own forms and expressions and procedures. And even though there was a significant um, convergence on the level of formal law, um, I agree with, with, with Pierre Le Grand in, in, in many ways that the specific legal mentalité, the way of thinking, the way to understand law and its role in society still differs substantially between the European member states. 
And now we face a slightly paradoxical situation potentially, that if I'm a trained lawyer in Germany and I want to practice in Ireland, I still have to pass the, the Irish uh, professional requirements. And if I'm a Spanish trained lawyer and I want to practice in Germany, I still have to go through a conversion course um, because the practice of law by humans uh, remains a prerogative of the member states. But at least potentially, um, the AI Act, through its uh, lowering of trade barriers, will mean that a legal tech product developed in Spain, and at least initially trained on Spanish law, can be offered as a service also in Germany. And conversely, a German uh, de de delivered and built system might be um, uh, have the right automatically um, to deliver services in Ireland. So here we find potentially at least this slightly worrying situation that AIs and uh, machines have already more rights than, 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 than humans. And I think that is something that should give us at least a little bit of pause. The second uh, thing to consider here is that the EU treats AIs as a product. And we can wonder in the legal system if you should think of justice as a product or if there are other values, other considerations that we should um, consider that make it inappropriate to frame the adequacy and the correctness of an AI tool through the lens of product liability law and through the mechanisms to, uh, that, 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 that ensure correct working of products. So these are already the first two things that I would just to, like to throw into the room because I think what they indicate is that um, in order to understand legal tech, we really have to be legal philosophers first and foremost. We have to understand what concept of justice is enshrined and heart baked into our legal system and how it differs maybe from solutions that, that an other country has chosen, which are also valid on its own terms, but still express very different cultural and, and uh, normative decisions. Um, the EU uh, AI Act uh, takes a risk-based approach. It distinguishes systems that have an acceptable risk and that are prohibited from those that are high risk, limited risk, and minimal risk. Um, those with limited risk and minimal risk will face a very light touch uh, regulatory regime. Those with high risk, potentially a more significant um, compliance burden. And um, legal tech, um, so just to talk about unacceptable risk that includes uh, most forms of facial recognition technology uh, in particular. Uh, initially, all FR was supposed to be prohibited, um, that that has been watered down a little bit. Certain forms of manipulation, um, deep fakes, things like that, they all fall into the unacceptable risk category. Um, most of the applications that in the justice system concern us fall into the high risk category. And these are those systems that pose a high risk to health, safety and fundamental rights. So for that reason alone, judicial or quasi-judicial decision making uh, will typically form uh, part of a high risk system and is either part of an already regulated system such as medical devices or in one of these um, eight fields that are particularly sensitive. And what we find here is uh, access to and enjoyment of essential services and benefits. And uh, that means, for instance, um, the, the, the uh, social security law, claims under social security law, um, all of these would fall under the high risk category law enforcement, but also the administration of justice and democracy. So um, almost all um, legal tech will fall in one form or the other in this uh, higher risk category. Um, I'm going to, to go through the next slides relatively quickly, um, partly because um, uh, it's, it's probably easier just uh, to, 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 to read up on that later on, um, but uh, it gives you a little bit idea of the flavor uh, and, and the general regulatory approach the uh, European Commission is proposing here. Um, for a high risk system, the manufacturer must undertake pre-marketing controls to establish product safety and performance. Again, the product liability approach here. Um, they then have to uh, get a CE mark 
they need to get some quality assurance um, system on it that then ensures that they can move freely across the European Union. And the justification for that is that the manufacturer having detailed knowledge of the design production process and so on and so forth is best placed to carry out the complete conformity assessment procedure. Conformity assessment therefore remains the obligation of the manufacturer alone. So a massive influence here, an emphasis on the manufacturer of the AI system more than the user and uh, more than um, potentially the government agency that is using them. And that will be one of the things we are going to come back to. There are a couple of general obligations, uh, creation of a management system, a documented risk management system that uh, updates throughout the system's life cycle, quite a number of uh, AI data quality criteria um, that, that need to be documented. Um, an important role of standards, and that, that, that's another thing that, that is, I think, extremely important here. Um, the European Committee for Standardization uh, and uh, the ECES um, are developing quite a number of quality standards for AI. And as long as the system can show that it adheres to these standards, there is a default assumption that it will get um, a, a CI, CE kite mark and therefore can then without further regulation be used across Europe. So here we find a situation where essentially a standardization body becomes the role of de facto lawmaker. Um, not a parliament, not a ministry, but a, a professional standards organization. And that is perfectly adequate if we are dealing with automated cars or with um, entertainment electronics uh, or entertainment AI. But I am rather concerned about the idea that a, a standard setting body that is entirely lacking democratic accountability um, will also set standards for technology that is used in the justice system. Um, imagine the outcry that we would have if our judges were to be evaluated by uh, the European Committee for Standardization and had to undergo tests according to their standards. We would deem this as utterly unacceptable. There would be an outcry, and rightly so. Uh, the, the idea that as a judge you are subordinate to, to a totally unelected and, and, and unauthorized standard setting body would, would, would be anathema. Um, but with legal tech, potentially that is exactly the situation that we are facing, um, that uh, compliance is thought not to the law, but to, to delegated uh, standard setting um, by an unelected body. Um, so for, for these reasons alone, um, we felt that um, we need also sector specific rules. We need uh, to go beyond uh, the approach that the EU chooses here and um, AI for People had then the third iteration of its uh, program. Um, banking and insurance, autonomous cars, media, law and legal services, energy, health and insurance. And I was responsible um, for uh, the law and legal services uh, part of that. And together with my, my co-authors that I'm mentioning here, Mary Hildebrand, Jakob Slosser, Ronan Kennedy, Elizabeth Staudecker and Jamie Baker, uh, we proposed 20 principles of ethical legal AI that try to find what is specific and unique about the law as a field of application and the specific challenges that that can uh, generate for legal tech. And as a foundational principle, we've identified uh, the rule of law um, and that any AI system must respect the integrity of the legal system, the values inscribed therein and adhere to practical and effective respect for the rule of law. And for that, it is necessary, we think, that any proposal for legal technology should be very explicit about what problem it supposedly solves, what problem it will not solve, and what problems it may create into the future. And um, one of the things that we find very often when we are looking at uh, legal tech projects uh, across the world um, is that they are very ambiguous about the type of problem they want to solve in reality. And very often a cost dimension, cost cutting dimension, um, that very clearly drives the development is less explicitly stated than some other alleged benefits that accrue from that. And that is, I think, something we find very problematic. Um, the respect for the rule of law also means um, that um, 
there's a respect for the integrity of the legal system. And that is for us, um, that was very important for me. Uh, also something that is organically grown. Um, that is the different uh, histories and uh, traditions of, of, of a legal system, which can't be separated from the law simply as a body of text. And that is one of the things that I think AI, legal AI has to adhere to. Oops. Oh, sorry. Um, there's a standard disclaimer when we are talking about AI ethics. Um, it was very important for us, and we said that at several parts of the document, that ethics is not a replacement for regulation, and that ethics normally starts when compliance with a law has been achieved. Um, so uh, I will adhere to uh, data protection principles is not an ethical standard. Um, adhering to equality duty under the Equality Act is not an ethical requirement. They are legal requirements and they shouldn't be repackaged as ethical requirements. So ethics for legal AI complements and does not replace a general uh, legal framework um, for AI. But having said that, law is special here and different from a couple of other uh, applications that we find. And the important thing is law is a regulated profession. Um, that is typically, if you are a lawyer, you are um, governed by the rules of your profession as a self-governing entity um, that sets its own standards and enforces them. So typically, um, you also have to adhere to the ethics rules of, um, say, the Law Society for uh, Scotland. And if you violate these principles, you get debarred, you get kicked out. So here we have ethics with enforcement, which is rather unusual. Um, so when I'm saying that ethics goes beyond uh, uh, the law and starts where compliance has already been achieved, I should say um, that diminishes or should not be seen as diminishing the important role of the professional bodies here. And again, that's where I think the AI Ethics Act gets it wrong by essentially putting these as third party regulators out of the picture. Um, we've seen the rules are directed to the manufacturer, not the user. Uh, and that means also in particular, it unburdens the lawyers uh, or the governments who are using the legal tech from their own responsibility. And for a regulated profession, um, I consider that as, as uh, utterly inappropriate. So in law, we are dealing here with this third type of regulatory agency, the professional bodies of the legal professions, and they should not be sidelined or undermined by a harmonized um, regulatory system. The stakes are particularly high. Uh, the trust in the justice system is also a precondition for social trust more widely. Once trust in the justice system breaks down, trust in many, many other systems falls with it. And uh, trust in AI often is backed up by trust in the law. And that also means that once the AI starts to diminish our trust in the justice system, um, some of the other uh, frameworks for AI governance also become precarious. Um, and that leads us to, to uh, one of the principles, I will probably not have time to talk you through all of them, um, but that's the principle of transversal impact assessment. Um, the rule of law and the concept of legality transcend the binary relation between individual and state or lawyer and client and constitute a common good. Evaluating ethical risk of employing AI in law must therefore consider long-term detrimental impact on third parties and on the common good of living lawfully. What do we mean with that? I mean, I gave you at the beginning of the slide that talked about predicting court decisions, one of these high risk uh, potential applications, knowing in advance how the court might decide. Now let's assume that the prediction of the AI is correct. And that is already a massive assumption. Yeah, but let's assume it correctly predicts the outcome of cases. That has benefits. It has a benefit for the client. I'm not investing time, money, resources in litigation that is hopeless. It has therefore also benefits for the justice system. Um, it doesn't clock the justice system with hopeless or frivolous cases, potentially. So it helps me, it helps my lawyer, it helps the justice system. What's not to like about that? That sounds all brilliant. But that comes at costs and risks once we go beyond the binary uh, relation between that specific client and that specific lawyer. And we look at the systemic risk for, for the rule of law and the legal system. For instance, um, we have a principle of public trial. 
It is important that the law is sometimes tested in court, that the decisions are communicated to the public, that it gets reassurance that the legal system still works. And the more cases are already blocked by an AI telling the parties, you don't have any chance at all that this uh, will win, settle it out of court, it deprives the legal system of its fuel. It provides, uh, deprives it uh, potentially of its, of its lifeblood. And with that, a very important public function of the trial that goes beyond deciding one individual case correctly, the educational effect it has on society, the reaffirmation of shared values and understanding, that suddenly becomes also problematic. And um, there's also the problem of ossification. AI always assumes that the past is a, re uh, is a reliable guide to the future. And uh, that means in particular that all these risk assessments, these predictions are made on the basis of past decisions. Sometimes what we find in the law is that the past decisions have to be revisited, that social mores change, that uh, societal understanding of certain rules is changing. And very, very often uh, the courts were here ahead of the legislator. If you had asked on Saturday, the 17th of May, 1984, uh, any lawyer in Scotland, how the courts would decide on the very next day a highly influential marital rape case, they all would have predicted the court to find in favor of the accused. Everyone agreed at that point, Scots law does not recognize marital rape as an offense. They would have all been wrong. Of course, the court did something extremely courageous and extremely unexpected and created this new offense. Had the client been advised by an AI that they were not having any chance at all, that case would never have reached the court and it would never have resulted in such an influential decision that overturned uh, centuries of, of, of jurisprudence. So we are again facing here a systemic risk um, that uh, necessary innovation in the legal system is blocked because an AI has already made an adverse risk assessment. So I think a ethically competent analysis needs to look beyond the individual users, individual client and their risks to the long uh, term effects that it can have on the justice system. I already mentioned the um, um, general principle here. Um, yes, the principle of ultimate responsibility, uh, that, that is um, I think one of these points again where we disagreed with the AI Act um, we do think that the use of an AI tool is an exercise of professional judgment. And as members of a profession, lawyers have particularly ethical responsibilities for the tools they choose for the discharge of the responsibility towards the collective and towards their clients. Uh, lawyers are also officers of the court. Their, their duty transcends uh, the duty to their client. So they have co uh, collectively and individually a high responsibility here that they can't offload to the manufacturer in the way the AI Act envisages that. So this specific uh, set of principles reiterates um, the unique responsibility that lawyers as members of a regulated profession have for the choice of their tools, including AI as a tool. And then one other way in which law is special, and that, that is one of the things that um, uh, again, resonates with, with some of the things I said earlier. Um, law is not just a way of reaching the right decision in the individual case. It's not like medicine, where the diagnosis has to be right, and if the diagnosis is right, the client will get better. Uh, law fulfills other function in addition. It's more than just a legal technique. It creates a specific type of collective identity. Um, every German school child grows up with that story that you see depicted here on the bottom. Um, that is the Miller of Sans Souci, Frederick the Great, the King, being annoyed by the noise that that mill is making and saying, I want it to be burnt down. And the Miller says, you can't do this. The law is on my side. And this was a sort of pivotal moment in history where a citizen was willing to assert his rights even in uh, the face of an absolute monarch. So the change from absolute to constitutional monarchy. Um, these are stories, these are important narratives that we tell ourselves. And it is unclear um, how they can be maintained once we outsource more and more of these activities 
um, to machines. There is a reason that our judges dress formally in the way that they do um, in the picture above. And uh, I, I tried to find a little bit of remind a, a little bit about Brazil in that context. And one of the um, people in, in, in Brazilian legal history that I found utterly fascinating um, was Lucio de uh, Mendoza. I'm sorry for my um, butchering his name here. Um, and as you know, I mean, he, he, he grew up as uh, opposition to, to the monarchy, one of the people who pressed for, for reform to become a republic, um, got into trouble with the law because of that, um, was, I think, barred from the university. But when Brazil became a republic, uh, eventually became um, also a member of the Supreme Court. And in addition, a founding member of the uh, Academy of Letters. And he was, I think, also an accomplished poet himself. Now, regardless how good a legal AI will be, it will never be able to, in addition of uh, being a competent judge, also write poetry, because AIs still tend to be very subject-specific idiosavants. Uh, they will know one thing, but not another thing. And I think if you look at, at, at influential judges like, like, like uh, uh, Mendoza, we, we see how their life history shaped their jurisprudence. How, how the experience of having opposed the monarchy uh, changed the way and shaped the way he was responding to the law. And replacing someone with such a rich life history by something that doesn't have a history, that is decontextualized, I think we are losing an important aspect of what we expect our justice system to deliver. Now, we all know that justice is supposed to be blind. And there's a certain irony in here because uh, he, he, he'd actually got blind uh, towards the end of his days. And at that time, that meant he had to withdraw from his role as judge, which I still find rather strange, <laughs> given that in a way that, that adhered to a very old principle of law. And here we can see some of the potential for AI, because um, what AI allows us to do increasingly is help people with, with disabilities, for instance, uh, to maintain their um, a productive life. So, so here we would have a, a possibility not to replace him as a judge, to, to reinstate him as a judge through AI by augmenting his capacities and his facilities and allow him to continue in a job for which he was uh, immensely qualified. So here we see, I think, a little bit of the Janus phase of technology as an enabler, but also potentially uh, as a barrier. Uh, and this, uh, again, for me, is this principle of cultural embeddedness. Um, legal AI takes place in an environment with significant power differentials and responsible development and employment of AI reflects on these structural conditions and protects against unfair redistribution of risks and benefits. And more ambitiously, AI in law should aim to reduce existing power imbalances. So going back to the first slide before, physical disabilities, obviously, um, that, that gravely and unjustly, I think, um, excluded him and others from the profession. Um, using it to, to, to overcome that hurdle is an uh, extremely worthwhile uh, approach. And um, with that connected uh, the principle of, of, of equal access to the law, that legal technology should always strive to maximize access to legal sources uh, for all, and it should in particular be used to widen access to groups that have historically faced significant access barriers. It must not lead to new obstacles, including technological and economical obstacles. Design for accessibility that considers a wide range of disabling factors in close consultation with the affected communities is central for ethical legal technology and alternative modes of access have to be preserved for those who cannot be accommodated any other way. So what we mean with that is what are the dangers here? Well, one of the dangers is that um, if our legal databases and the legal AI tools to search them are commercially owned, LexisNexis, Westlaw, um, do we face a situation where you have to pay as a citizen to know what the law is? And I think that is always unacceptable. We can't give private ownership of a public good as the law. Um, but obviously, those who develop the AI systems also want a business model that is, that is feasible. So here we face a, a, a real issue here. How can we reconcile copyright, copyright protection with that principle of uh, equal access to the law when the gatekeepers of the law increasingly become technology companies? As you said in, in, in the introduction, the high... Um, um, 
the fourth uh, high is that, that you identified the high tech companies here as, as, as one potential um, issue. Um, we can use technology to uh, increase access to help people um, who find the law unintelligible to translate it into something that they might find easier to digest. That would be a highly ethical use. But we also face the difficulty that suddenly people who are not able to use a technology feel themselves excluded. And that is for us uh, one of the key issues here that technology has to solve. And the only example I want to give, and I have to finish my talk there, but it's one uh, of which I feel very, very strongly, is uh, the question of AI and languages. In the UK, um, we have a two um, legally recognized minority languages, uh, Welsh and Gaelic. And uh, in addition, uh, at least under the European Charter for Minority and Regional Languages, Scots is also protected as a force uh, language. Um, increasingly, we have data models for English, and we have search engines for English, and we have digitization projects for the English language version of our quarter sessions, but we do not have the same AI models for Welsh and Gaelic, simply because they are fewer speakers. Uh, Data-driven language models work best if you have huge numbers of speakers, so it works well for English, it works for Spanish, it works for Chinese, um, but the moment uh, you have a language with very few speakers, it becomes much, much more difficult um, to build an appropriate AI system. Now, here we have a legal, legal requirement um, that our legal sources must be, as a matter of national law, available in Gaelic. But we face a problem uh, to have robust language models for, 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 for that language. Um, and that is, I think, a potential danger here that what is technologically possible might push these minority languages even further into marginalization, where what we would want is to use technology to make it easier for them to access the law in the language that they understand. And that obviously is also the situation in Brazil, uh, where obviously you speak this, uh, at, at least regionally, I understand is uh, recognized Hunsrück, uh, Hunsrück Deutsch as, uh, as, as an officially recognized languages, but in addition, 218 languages, 201 of them indigenous, 17 non-indigenous. Um, I don't tell you anything new here, but here we face a real issue of how could we potentially use AI to increase access to justice, to legal sources for people of a huge range of uh, minority languages, making the law visible and accessible for them. And at the same time, facing the problem that um, AI-driven language models tend to prefer those with um, huge numbers of speakers. Minority languages obviously often trace a social exclusion uh, and uh, also for that, things like access, increased access, like automated translation of court proceedings, simplification, automated simplification of court proceedings could be extremely valuable, but can hinder access for minority speakers if your chatbot only listens in English. Um, we have the problem that female voice AI reinforces biases, as a UN report has shown. Alexa speaks in uh, speaks like a woman, but she listens like a man. And that is she ignores women when they talk with issues with um, barriers in, 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 in um, uh, the, the language models. So again, I, I'm just flagging this up to show how the cultural embeddedness of law and the tracing of uh, fault lines of social in exclusion pose massive opportunities for legal tech, but also massive dangers. And because I'm reaching more or less already the, the, the end, I'm obviously not able to uh, work through all of this. Um, just one final thought um, um, from me, um, what this means for us as teachers and educators uh, of legal, of, of, of law in an age of AI. And what it means for me, and I, that's why I intentionally gave you examples which had less to do with legal reasoning, that had more to do with language translation or with tools that, that allow you to, to see again. I don't think that we necessarily need to teach coding for lawyers, but I do think that we need to teach more and maybe a differently taught jurisprudence. Um, sorry, don't know what went wrong there <laughs> with my writing. Uh, I think that um, the question that jurisprudence always asked are exactly the type of questions we now need to reconsider in the age of AI. 
we have to ask ourselves what standards do we evaluate the AI against? What makes a good virtuous judge? That is the benchmark for a legal tech. And that requires us to reflect about the virtues and, and, and what we mean with a good lawyer. And that is obviously the perennial question for legal theory. What do we mean when we say the AI gets it right? What is the nature of legal knowledge? Is it really predicting what the courts say, which is a very common law approach, or is it to correctly identify an abstract heaven of legal concepts and come to the scientifically true answer, um, a very civilian uh, approach to AI? Uh, we have to rethink again what it means to say to have knowledge of the law when we want to evaluate um, legal AI correctly. And with that, we have a very, very different mindset from the one that the European Union proposes here. The European Union, as I said, thinks of AI as a product, as something that can be bought and sold, and that works for many applications, but it doesn't work for justice. And in justice, I think we need lawyers who, on the one hand, understand these opportunities of technology, but are always able to challenge it and to reevaluate it from the perspective of a perennial jurisprudence. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, de dear Professor Schaffer, uh, thank you so much for the fascinating uh, presentation. If I may use, uh, borrowing your last slides about minority languages, a minor an expression that will be understood by a minority of the attendants of this seminar, es war hervorragend. Uh, may I uh, uh, say that you presented in a very uh, uh, apparently simple, but a very sophisticated uh, way, uh, uh, main concept and questions about this, uh, what, you, what you said, this uh, relationship between uh, artificial intelligence uh, and law. And uh, may I, uh, uh, as people are thinking about questions, may I, uh, pose you uh, one question about something fascinating, which is uh, the issue of innovation. Uh, uh, it, it struck me that uh, uh, your case that you mentioned in uh, on the court in, in the Scottish court about the, the sexual violence of intimate partners, a bit marital violence, uh, that. Uh, technology or technological innovation might uh, uh, avoid uh, legal innovation to happen. And as you are uh, a person, because of your background, because of your, your, your academic background, your experience, you are a systemic view person, how should we deal with this issue of innovation, which we believe it's important for the advancement of society in a, in a way that can uh, accomplish uh, uh, or open space or, or, or make have a con 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 convergence between different dimensions of innovation. I don't know if I could make myself clear, but it, it struck me. Absolutely. Uh, and and it's, it's a really interesting and very, very difficult question for me. Um, the first thing to notice, <clears throat> I said AI is inherently conservative to a certain degree. Uh, it learns from the past. And that is, in the legal context, not a bad thing. I have to re-emphasize this because sometimes uh, <clears throat> it, it might all, all, almost seem as I'm going too far in the opposite direction. Things like the doctrine of binding precedent and knowing the rules in advance, all of these things are extremely important for us to, to, learn, to live lawfully, um, to, to have a, a life secured in our rights requires that the law remains predictable. And that, that means that it also has to look back. Um, so that is definitely always was one aspect of the law, but it was never the only aspect of the law. We always mitigated the formalist approach and, and, and the rigorous predictability of the law with um, things that then allowed us to transcend it, to go beyond it. So, for instance, we have harsh punishment, but we also have the possibility of mercy and amnesties, sometimes used through discretionary judgment by um, a politician to balance this out, so the rigor of the formal law and, and, and the need to be humane and, and to give 
justice in the individual case. And innovation falls into that same gray area. We do not want lawyers to be too innovative. And we don't want them to be innovative all the time. We, we need a degree of predictability, but it doesn't mu it, it mustn't overtake and overwhelm all the other aspects of the law. And how to ensure that in a technological environment is really difficult. Um, my, my fear, my, my feeling would be that there's a danger that um, the increased use of technology emphasizes one aspect of justice at the expense of all the other aspects. And uh, one other of these other aspects is being creative, being recognizing that a new solution is, is needed um, going beyond this. Um, there was a really interesting moment when Soto Mayor was uh, in, in, in the hearings for being a, a Supreme Court judge in the US, where she said, OK, on the one hand, I bring my life experience to that. It's time for ha having a wise old Latina on the Supreme Court, as she as, as she put it, um, because my life experience matters. But I'm not just my life history. I'm not determined entirely by my past. As a judge, I can reflect upon it. I can realize where I'm coming from, and that allows me to transcend it, to go beyond it. And both is important. Both the being rooted in the past, having my life history, my life experience that I can bring to the case, and the human ability to reflect about that and transcend it. AIs only have, if at all, the first ability to, to reason about huge data from the past and, and then predicting how the future should look like. But this moment of stepping back, holding for a moment, reflecting, and then transcending what they've learned that they don't do. How can we solve this problem? I don't know. Um, to, to go back to your question, I honestly don't know what the right governance structure for that would be. The only thing I would point out is that the notion of AI as being non-creative is challenged from a very different field. We now get creative AIs that compose music, that um, write poetry. Um, Australia has just accepted an AI as inventor on a patent application. So there are fields of AI where we search for innovate, in, in, innovativeness and, and novelty. And one interesting future research project that we are working on in Edinburgh a little bit is to see if that type of AI can also teach us about innovation in the justice system to understand better what we mean with good creativity. Uh, by a judge. Under which conditions is a judge not just crazy and weird and, 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 and odd, but creative in a good way? And that is a really, really difficult question. Thank you. <laughs> At the end, you mentioned, and I never thought about that, that uh, creativity has some connection with cholesterol. You have the good and the bad one. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure that, yes, we have a a question of Barbara Nascimento, uh, I may read it. Uh, do you think uh, the observer can change the observed object? Uh, if AI observes trials and reads, quote unquote, judges, <clears throat> do you think judges will be affected by the predictions? Is this a problem? Mm, yes, I mean, that, that, I, I think that that is always a danger. Um, the use of technology, if you like, changes the ground rules and um, that potentially then affects behavior of, of the person um, who is observed. I think that was part of the reason why France actually enacted a law prohibiting the profiling of court decisions against a, a specific judge. So um, France has a very specific um, rather unusual law in that respect that says a data mining of court decisions is not permitted if it is used to predict how an individual judge will decide. And part of the jurisprudential reason behind that is in, in, in the French tradition, um, it is the court that decides rather than a judge. In common law countries, judges proudly put their name to the decision and uh, even the dissenting opinion have the name of the judge. That is, I think, in the civilian tradition, I think Brazil it would be probably the same, still rather unusual. Um, normally, it's the court that decides, the people that decide, it's not the judge that decides. And uh, to some extent, what the French system wanted to do was to preserve that fiction, if you like, or that, that 
concept of justice, but they also wanted to prevent, I think, exactly what your question was worried about, that judges start to write for the AI, that they write in such a way that the AI understands them correctly and doesn't say, oh, that judge is terrible or biased or, or for, for some other reason not good. Uh, and I do think that that is definitely a problem, um, that, that it might affect um, the, the, the way um, judges behave. There's a second aspect to this, and, and this goes back, I mean, we, we had similar ideas in the 1970s. In the 1970s, when we first had um, digitalization of court decisions, machine-readable court decisions, the technology of the time wasn't able to deal with the complexity of, of human language particularly well. So some people said, it's a fault of the judges, not of the technology. They just have to write differently. They should write simple subject, predicate, object sentences so that the technology can understand it. And I think there's, there's definitely, there are, again, initiatives in that direction um, that say, we shouldn't get better technology, we should change the way um, we, we behave so that it becomes easier for the technology to work. And that, again, might have very negative consequences to it because it forces people to adhere to, 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 to the technology rather than the other way around. So I, I would say you're absolutely right. There is definitely a danger that once you are aware that your decisions are going to be analyzed in that way, you will write them differently. Thank you, Professor Schaffer. Uh, Klinger Souza poses uh, also an interesting question. <clears throat> Uh, in Brazil, uh, a German uh, legal principle became a kind of famous. It is the domain of fact. Mm. Uh, maybe it, uh, uh, it does make sense in Germany, but in Brazil, it uh, produced a lot of controversy. Can uh, AI help us, uh, help to protect us from uh, this type of imports? <laughs> ah, I would say probably the opposite, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, again, simply because if you look at the reality, and and, and, and that was um, uh, Professor Polonsky in introduction, there's a danger of the big international companies as well. Um, their business model will be, if that works in my main market, and, and, and my judges and my lawyers in my main market are happy with my product, and those in my secondary markets will just have to live with it. Um, so, so I would say there could be much more of transfer of legal concepts through the back door, just in the way, say, a search engine is set up, uh, just the way in which information retrieval for courts work, because one model that works well in one big jurisdiction uh, is transposed to, um, to other jurisdictions. Um, legal transplants are always dangerous, they're always um, difficult. Uh, we had an interesting project a long time ago, a PhD student of mine uh, from, from Mexico. Um, she tried to develop an AI to teach judges who had been brought up with a much more continental European model of adjudication, more, more German and, 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 and French than, than uh, Anglo-American, and now who had to retrain for the adversarial system that became much, much more dominant in Mexico in, in, in recent years. And that requires a very different mindset. And, and, and what we tried to find out in, in, in that project was, can AI help them to, to start to think in this adversarial way, which is very different from, from what, what, what they were used to. Um, and in that sense, I really think AI can sometimes help. It can, can sometimes be a good training resource. Um, preventing a legal system from ill-advisedly adopting substantial law from another country, no. Um, I don't see an immediate um, way for that. Again, possibly, if at all, the other way around um, by having automated machine translation available um, foreign law becomes more accessible. And with that, the ability to borrow from foreign law, to learn from its experience becomes easier rather than more difficult. And I totally agree with your point. Uh, legal transplants very, very often do not work and uh, cause unexpected um, uh, responses in the receiving uh, body that just can't work around that, 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 that odd context. So, so 
potentially, again, we have here an advantage, uh, more legal knowledge becomes available, but also a systematic risk that ill-advisedly concepts are now flowing uh, across borders. Thank you, Professor Schaffer. We are approaching uh, the limit. Professor Arbik said that I will be dismissed if we uh, uh, abuse uh, because, because of the time difference. But uh, it, uh, another point that struck me uh, uh, has to do with this issue of regulation and law. It means uh, norms, standardization, and laws. Uh, let me introduce uh, by uh, making a connection with this last question and your answer with the issue that has to do strictly with regulation uh, or with norms, uh, which is the issue of uh, uh, building certifications, a sustainable building certification. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a world uh, uh, system very much uh, adopted in the world that was developed, let's say, in the Northern Hemisphere, to not to mention any specific country, and that evaluates, gives points to a building to consider sustainable or not, according, for instance, to the energy matrix that is used in, 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 in those countries. So for instance, in, 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 a, in a typical country on, on that country specifically that I'm, uh, where, where, the law, where the standard was developed, uh, using gas is something positive because it's not uh, coal. Mm. But in a country such as Brazil, uh, we have better solutions. So by using gas, it, it should be in some sense, maybe uh, not evaluated in the same way. Now, uh, the answer at our university was to develop, and it's uh, obviously not as widespread as, uh, as the other one, but uh, it's already used in other countries, uh, a different, uh, just a different standard mm -hmm. that is, is here. So in this uh, complicated environment of, of standardization, which is very also, uh, anyhow, very interesting because it's multi-party, but also uh, very subject to influences. Uh, my, my, my point is, if this uh, apparent controversy between uh, uh, the law operators and, 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 uh, and the uh, operators of standards, uh, it doesn't anyhow uh, bring the idea of the barber's paradox. It means uh, the, the, the law operators uh, uh, are kind of a barbers. I mean, uh, it, it, I, you, I, I judge about that, but it's not for me. So maybe you can end with some comment about that. Yeah, um, I, I mean, as, as I indicated, one, one of the problems has become that so much of the regulatory power is, is yielded by, by standard setting bodies. And that's not just in, in uh, obviously in the AI field, environmental, as, as you said, in the UK, we just had this major problem with the Grenfell fire in London, um, where the UK developed its own fire safety standard that was informed by UK experience uh, in the Second World War, really, and didn't fit any longer to modern buildings uh, and, and the risk profile of modern buildings. Um, and uh, uh, thinking about AI in, in this context, um, I think you are right that it has both, it both dimensions, like the bow doesn't save, shave him, him himself. Um, not that the two of us would shave, um, <laughs> obviously, but. Um, uh, there's the, a the self-reflective use of these standards here and against what we want to evaluate something and against what we want to evaluate technology and everything that is not measured any longer doesn't count any longer. Um, I, I think that is this great risk with all of these standards that by designing a matrix, um, we lose the ability to trace all the values, all the things that matter for us that can't be quantified. Um, I'm just came out today from a, a conference that we are having here in Edinburgh on military AI uh, and um, battlefield robotics. And, and we have exactly the same problem there, um, that if the standard says the only thing that you want to optimize your AI against is the speed of decision making, all the other values that you might want to have as a good commander become irrelevant and you don't notice them any longer and you don't 
articulate them any longer. It's the same with legal AI. Very often it's, it's speed that, that is the, the evaluating factor. And um, that is something we often might not want. And there's one, one nice example in that context. Um, uh, and, and it really reminded me of, of what you said about the paradoxical application of an environmental standard in one system that has the opposite effect in another. One of the key selling points for legal tech very often is it will deliver justice faster and with fewer costs. And there's a huge positive thing in that. Um, access to justice should be cheap. Uh, to a certain extent, and it should be fast. I shouldn't have to wait for justice too long. On the one level, that's absolutely true. But on the other level, think about a world where I can sue my neighbor very, very quickly by taking out my mobile phone and right swiping him and pressing a button and automatically a letter is uh, generated that says you played music after 10 o'clock or you didn't put the garbage out when you were supposed to um, stop doing this or I sue you. Or every time I see on Twitter something, I find mildly offensive and start a defamation lawsuit. You could make the argument that the costs of our legal system also play a beneficial role to maintain social peace by making people think twice before they go to court, by trying to find a peaceful, friendly settlement. You don't always have to sue your, your neighbor, your family, uh, some anonymous guy on the internet. There are other ways. And sometimes um, the, the time delay that our bureaucracy generates allows us to reflect, to not act out of anger, to, to, to rethink things. And that is the point where this metric that in many, many contexts works correctly, cheap and fast is good, can suddenly have negative social um, consequences if it increases litigiousness and, 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 and conflict. And that is exactly the problem of the standard setting. If the standard only values speed, then it will measure only speed. And the only thing that will count is speed. And all the other values that we also cherish, they become marginalized. And that is, again, one of these, these huge challenges to, to see which values have been silenced by that specific technology. And is, 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 is that creating a problem? Professor Schaffer. I don't know how to thank you for uh, your candid uh, presentation, uh, so dense, so full of good examples, so uh, enriching, and uh, it's a great start for our seminar. Uh, we hope to see you, yes, in Sao Paulo, and uh, we'll make a high five. And uh, thank you so, so much. Uh, we wish you a, a happy, ending of this year and uh, uh, a happy new year that we hope will have uh, less uh, troubles than we have had during the past time, past times, past two years. And again, thank you so much on behalf of the organizers. It was great to know you and, uh, and to hear from you. And we are sure that uh, this dialogue will continue and uh, it will be a pleasure to continue uh, to, to participate in more events and have you in other situations. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Happy Christmas, Happy New Year to, to all of you. And as you said, hopefully uh, sometime soon uh, together in the physical form, either in Edinburgh or, or in Sao Paulo. And Edinburgh is a great city. I had the pleasure of oh, knowing yes. it. A bit, a bit, a bit rainy, but other than that, fantastic. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. Uh, may I give you back the mic? Okay. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much, Professor Schaeffer, Professor David Leslie. Thank you so much for excellent presentations. And even uh, Lucio Mendonca has been mentioned here, and he's, uh, he was a former uh, law student at our university. And uh, once we start studying law, we hear so much about the poets. And uh, uh, in addition to be a lawyer, he, is, he was also a poet. And I liked so much to hear an international speaker talking 
talking about uh, a someone like a Brazilian personality. So it was a great presentation. And thank you so much, Professor Ari, for your great mediation. Thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. It was a great session, I believe. And I am quite sure that everything we have heard and discussed here today will drive you further along in your uh, researches and surveys. I would like to thank you all for your time and participation. And I'd like to remind you that tomorrow morning we are going to resume at half past eight, uh, Professor Varsman, who is part of the C4 IAI committee. She'll be our moderator and she is helping us a lot in this sense to have a very fair inclusive environment this is our goal to have an inclusive and responsible environment and professor renata vasman will be our moderator and professor crocker from the metropolitan university of manchester who will talk about how to build up a trustworth ai Having said that, thank you so much for your participation today. Have a wonderful evening and see you tomorrow. Thank you.